Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 6. And as you turn there, let me just bring you the warm greetings of Puritan Reform Seminary. We do indeed, as Joey just mentioned, Dr. Piper just mentioned, owe a lot to Greenville in our history and our co-laboring. And we do, we do see Greenville Presbyterian Seminary as the closest bonded seminary and fellowship that we have in, in America, though we do communicate, of course, with many others, but we really, we really do have a bond with you, and that's felt um, at our seminary, and I trust it's felt also here. So I'm, I'm grateful to, to bring you God's Word today in these two subjects that are far above all of our heads, and I'm only hoping to stammer a little bit about them, God's holiness and God's love. Hear the word of God from Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Thus far the reading of God's sacred and precious and holy word. Let's pray. Lord God, rend the heavens, holy, holy, holy God, and come down and visit us at this conference this day and graciously bless all these messages on thy holy attributes and help us to stammer something about these two precious attributes of holiness and love in the closing sessions of this conference. O oh God, may we worship thee in spirit and in truth and love thee and be known of thee and be loved by thee with the same love with which thou hast loved thy only begotten Son, some of that same love as thou thyself hast prayed, Lord Jesus, in thy great high priestly prayer of John 17. So help us now and bless us and be near to us. And may we, may we leave this conference filled with a sense of the glory and the beauty and the holiness and the love and the wisdom and, well, the whole panorama of the attributes of thy great being. O oh God, help us to bow in the dust and crown thee Lord of all. To say with Samuel Rutherford, I know not which divine person I love the most, but this I know, I love each of them, and I need them all. We thank thee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for thy wondrous being, thy glorious essence, thy three persons, and thy every attribute, all wrapped in one in thee. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I think we can all agree that without equivocation, the greatest need of the church today 
is an encounter with the holiness of God. What we desperately need is not merely a renewed understanding of his holiness, that too, but an actual reckoning with him in the majesty, the purity, and the grace of his holiness. Now theologians, reformers, Puritans, have all recognized that there are a variety of glorious dimensions to the holiness of God. A. A. Hodge said, the holiness of God is not to be conceived of as merely one attribute among others. It's rather a general term representing the conception of his consummate perfection and total glory. And Hodge goes on to say, which is transcendently august and venerable majesty in his moral purity. And of course, that just resonates with the biblical testimony everywhere in Scripture that God is transcendently holy, as well as holy in his moral perfection. And both of these aspects can be seen clearly in Isaiah chapter 6. And so I'm going to use this passage as our guide, and I want to look at this uh, glorious subject, or stammer a little bit about it, in three dimensions. First, its majesty. Second, holiness of God in its purity, moral purity. And then thirdly, the holiness of God in its grace to us and our need for holiness as a result of God's holiness manifest to us. So God, God's holiness in its majesty, its purity, and its grace. Well, the climactic Old Testament revelation of God's holiness certainly appears in Isaiah's vision in chapter 6. Actually, the whole Bible is speaking of God's holiness everywhere. We think of holiness as something that means uh, to make holy or to be holy when it comes to us. When it comes to us, we think of negatively to be separate from sin and positively to be consecrated and dedicated to God and conform to Christ. But what we often don't realize is that the holiness of God is the center of Scripture in many dimensions. When we think of holiness, we should think first of all of God, not of our sanctification. The Bible actually speaks more of God's holiness than of ours. And God's holiness, the Bible tells us, is the very essence of his being. Isaiah alone calls God the Holy One 26 times. Holy is prefixed to God's name, not only in terms of the Holy Spirit, but to God in general, in the three persons, more than any other attribute. Holiness is his permanent crown, his glory, his beauty. Jonathan Edwards says, if it is possible to understand it, that God's holiness is more than a mere attribute of God. It's the sum of all his attributes. It's the outshining of all that God is. I was once standing on the shore of an ocean just as the sun was rising and the waves were coming in pretty big waves, but at the top of every wave, there was this pure white light across the entire wave. And it just struck me at that moment. This is like God's holiness. It's the capstone of every attribute he has. And it comes at us in scripture, wave after wave in his purity, its brightness, its, its whiteness. It designates God's separateness from his entire creation, his apartness in the very first place, but also his moral perfection, his absolute purity, his total absence from all sin. And it teaches us, secondly, 
the importance of approaching God with holy sacrifice that involves the shedding of blood. There's no way in the Old Testament to approach God without blood. There's no way in the New Testament to approach God without the blood of his son. And the beauty of God's holiness is that he is so holy, he has found a way in his son that we can approach him through the blood shedding, through the cross of Calvary. And that ought to just humble us, brothers and sisters, in the dust before God, that there's a way to approach a holy, holy God through Jesus. Thomas Goodwin had an incredible experience in his life when he said that through the blood of Christ, he was enabled, as it were, to sit among the three persons of the Trinity and to be overwhelmed by their communion with him in holiness and in grace for the sake of the blood of Christ. Well, this is something that Isaiah saw. He saw it in Isaiah 53, of course, preeminently. That chapter of which Augustine said, Methinks Isaiah was the fifth gospel writer, as if he lived right by the cross. Isaiah here, though, in Isaiah 6, sees the Lord holy, lifted up on an exalted throne, transcendent in regal majesty, supreme over the affairs of men, worshipped by the hosts of heaven. Oh, how majestic, how sovereign, how great is the holiness of God in Isaiah chapter 6. He uses the word God in verses 1, 3, 5. The Lord, Yahweh of hosts, the King. Everywhere you see Isaiah is filled with seeing the Lord. He sees Adonai, ruler, magister, master, sovereign, exalted one. The one supreme over angel, angelic powers and earthly kings. The one who is separate and alone in his holiness. As Thomas Goodwin said, alone in his being. Now of all that could have been said or attributed to him in Isaiah 6, this sets up God as the highest, as the most sovereign. And this of all others lays us low, both as we are creatures and as we are sinners, for God's holiness separates him from all creatures. Goodwin concludes. So the holiness of God exalts him to the highest and it abases us to the lowest. It casts down human pride into the dust. And so this holiness is the peculiar glory, the peculiar majesty of his divine nature. Edward Lee said that God's essential holiness is the incommunicable eminency of the divine majesty exalted above all. Herman Bobbing said he is rather called holy in a comprehensive sense in connection with every revelation that impresses humans with his deity. And R.C. Sproul put it so well, God's holiness signifies everything about God that sets him apart from us and makes him an object of awe, of adoration, and of dread to us. So God's holiness reminds us that his difference from us is not merely quantitative, as if God were just somehow at a higher level than us, because he, well, is just that much more holy than us. We're talking about a qualitative difference. We're talking about a category by itself. In Revelation 15, 4, the sinless saints sing, Thou only art holy. And another writer says it this way, There's a terrifying unfamiliarity in the things that God says about himself and his holiness. And so even the seraphim, the sinless angels, are covering their faces with their wings, 
and crying out in heavenly places, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Understanding an essential difference between God's holiness and their own, even though they've never sinned. Stephen Sharnock put it this way, Holiness is a substance of God, but a quality and accident in a creature. God is infinitely holy, creatures finitely holy. He is holy from himself. Creatures are holy by derivation from him. Though God hath crowned the angels with an unspotted sanctity and placed them in a habitation of glory, yet as illustrious as they are, they have an unworthiness in their own nature to appear before the throne of so holy a God. Their holiness grows dim and pale in the presence of God's. Their holiness, angelic holiness, is but a weak shadow of the divine purity whose light is so glorious that it makes them cover their faces out of weakness to behold it and cover their feet out of shame in themselves. And who are we to be in the presence? Sinners! hell-worthy, fallen sons and daughters of Adam, in the presence of this majestic holiness. That holiness of which Thomas Watson said, it is the sparkling jewel of God's diadem. Yes, God is majestically holy. And everywhere in Scripture, this majestic holiness is connected, correlates with his glory and his beauty. Seeing his beauty, his glorious beauty, causes us to be irresistibly attracted to his holiness, even though we stand in awe of it, so that we desire, above all, to reflect in some small way his image in true righteousness and holiness as Paul says in Ephesians 4, 24. And so the very highest task of theology is not just an intellectual striving to grasp something of this holiness, but it's the contemplation of God gazing upon him through his own self-revelation in the scriptures and being beautified by that contemplation of this infinitely beautiful God in his glorious holiness. You know, it struck me. I was in the Netherlands once and preached uh, through a translator about the beauty of God in a sermon, and a minister walked into the uh, session room directly after the sermon, and he shook my hand and he said, Thank you for preaching about the beauty of God. And then he added this. There are far too few sermons on that subject. And it really struck me when he said that. You know, David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after. That I may behold the beauty of the Lord in his temple. That's a great thing. For a believer to see God as beautiful in his holy glory. To gaze upon him. To encounter him in his holy presence. This is what Isaiah has here. And that holiness, you see, just goes so far beyond our intellectual uh, yearnings and graspings and seekings. But it... it, it it lays hold of us so that we just fall in worship before Almighty God. Fall in awe and dread and are fascinated and entranced by the Holy One. And it moves us to cover our faces, to lie down in our shame and nakedness before this Holy God. Evidencing both dread and delight at the same time. And this high view of God... You see, in his glorious holiness makes us have a profound view of sin, as the Puritans would say, and a high esteem for worship. 
like Ambrosi said to Bozo in his great classic, Why God, Man. Bozo, your problem is you have such a low view of God because you have a low view of sin. But if you understood what it means to sin against a holy God, you would understand a glorious contemplation of the beauty and the majesty of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so as the Puritans put it, if we lose sight of God's holiness, we will lose fervor and childlike fear in our worship. Joy Piper put it well when he said we worship him because of who he is. One of the reasons, therefore, our worship totters on the edge of irrelevance is because we do not come into God's presence aware of who he is. God is majestically holy. The seraphim Isaiah speaks of, you see, are like bright lights in Isaiah 6 to show us this. They are, they're called a flaming fire in Psalm 104, verse 4. They burn with holy fire, burning with holy zeal, for the holy God. Their, their entire being is lit ablaze and taken up with the act of purest worship. And if we get just a glimpse, just a glimpse, Rutherford called it blinks and glances, of the, of the, of the greatness of our God, we will find that we too are impelled to worship him with our whole mind and soul and heart and strength. And then our apathetic prayers and our half-hearted devotions and our sluggishness in service and our irreverence in worship will be transformed, transformed into fervent activities set ablaze by the fire of God's holiness, radiating with reverent delight that beautifies what we do in the service of the king. And so the Puritans said our calling in life as believers is to be bright white flames for the glory of our holy, majestic God. But secondly, God's holiness has moral implications, massive moral implications as well. Beginning with the righteous character of God himself and reaching to the moral character and conduct of all angels and men. Think of the sun. God's holiness is, is reflected just, just a tad bit in the sun. Its massive presence exerts pervasive force so that everything within the solar system must revolve around its brilliant glory. But God's presence is infinitely more pervasive than the sun. Nothing in creation lies beyond or outside of the influence of his holiness. God's holiness in its moral dimensions can best be appreciated if we consider its relationship to, to three things. First of all, its relationship to his own glory. God's holiness entails his purpose to glorify himself in all that he does, for he alone is the glorious God. If he is supremely sacred, then he must honor himself as such and require that others do the same, or he would deny himself. The whole earth, the angel said, the whole earth is full of his glory. Thomas Goodwin said, holiness is that whereby God aims at his own glory. James Usher said that God's holiness means that he most, most justly loveth, liketh, and prefereth himself above all. Edward Lee said, God's holiness is that excellency of his nature by which he gives himself unto himself, doing all for himself and in all and by all and above all, aiming at his own pleasure and glory. 
The Lord commands us to love him with all our hearts, all our souls, and all our strength. But God alone is able to love himself with an infinite love. And thus he alone is infinitely holy in his entire moral character. This is amazing. This goes beyond our comprehension. But this is an important aspect of God's holiness. The perfection of his glorious moral character. He's the Holy One, Habakkuk says, who is of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on iniquity with approval and pleasure. But secondly, his moral holiness is not only related to his own glory, but also it's related to our sin. And Isaiah understands this with patience. Painful clarity as this divine vision overwhelms him of God's holiness and then breaks him and threatens to destroy him. So that in verse 5, he recalls his sinfulness and the sinfulness of the people. And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been on your face before God, before his astonishing holiness? Crying out, I'm just a sinner, Lord. I'm just, I'm just, I'm nothing but sin. I've got a bad record. I've got a bad heart. I'm just a lost sinner, hellbound, unworthy. I swim in sin like fish swim in water. But when Isaiah is taken up into the atmosphere of heaven, he's like a fish out of water. The sights were terrifying. The sounds were sublime. The very air was dense with the luminescent smoke of the divine presence. But why? Why, you may ask? Does he just talk about his lips? The lips of all things. Well, it's because of the praises of the seraphim, isn't it? Isaiah's unclean lips stand in contrast to the purity and the power of the praises of the heavenly hosts. Their worship was untainted, unhindered by sin. And they could not cease to praise God nonstop. So overwhelmed were they at the sight of his glory. So thunderous was their praise that the very posts of the door were shaken, in verse 4, by the reverberation of the sound. And that shook it jolted Isaiah to the core of his being. In the sight of that vision, he realized how little regard he had for God, how little he really knew God, how little he had ever praised God as he ought. The weight of God's holy glory so penetrated his being that it constrains praise from him now. And yet he's overwhelmed because he cannot praise him as he ought. And he's so overcome with the sense of his unworthiness in the sight of such purity. He sees himself as so unworthy to even utter one word of God's praise. So he just cries out, woe is me, woe is me. I deserve to die. I'm a man of unclean lips. And notice what he confesses. Not just his profane speech, not just the words that he did and did not say but the lips that make utterance. He traces the sin of his speech to its root in his being. I am a man of unclean lips. I just don't speak too shallowly of thee. I just don't speak sinful things, but I'm a man of profane speech. My entire life, my entire heart, my person, my humanity is characterized by inherent taintedness and fallenness and corruption. Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. My sinful lips betray my sinful nature, betray the plague of my heart. Isaiah 8, 13, he says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. So that's exactly what happens if you know what I mean. If you know what, if, if you know what Isaiah means here, of what it comes into coming into the presence of God and being overwhelmed, overwhelmed by his holiness. In the beginning of creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. 
And when God begins to make us a new creation by grace, he sheds light in our hearts. And as he sheds light in our hearts, we begin to have knowledge of ourselves. And he bombards our understanding with a sense of his holiness, even as he bombards our understanding with a sense of our own unholiness. And that's the dilemma of Calvin at the beginning of the Institutes. Am I, am I going to talk, first of all, about a man's knowledge of himself or a man's knowledge of God? And he says, well, they both happen at the same time. And they both go together. Well, I, I'll, I'll pick starting with God, but really the two are inseparable. This is what Isaiah is experiencing here. Moses says, thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance, in the light of thy holiness. And when that happens, you see, what we formerly regarded as, at best, small, or at worst, small sins, now become grave transgressions. Little peccadilloes become monstrous atrocities in the light of God's infinite holiness and worthiness. And so we cry out with David in Psalm 51, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. When you're in God's presence, you don't justify or rationalize any sin anymore, but you confess it, you abhor it, you forsake it. We cry out for truth. Psalm 51 is such a wonderful example of that, isn't it? Verse 6, David says, I want truth in the inward parts. The gravity of our transgressions becomes commensurate with our sense of the enormity of God's holiness. So we need to ask ourselves, what do we know of this humbling work of the Spirit? What do we know of this catching a glimpse of God's holy glory? Glory. Has my heart, has your heart ever been pierced and cut asunder by God's penetrating purity? I'm not talking here about just natural conscience pangs, but I'm talking about the piercing of the so spirit sword into the very joints and marrow to expose the thoughts and intentions of the heart in all their impurity in the light, the light of God's holiness. And then the question must be, if you do know what that means, what did you do with it? What did you do with it? Because conviction of sin alone is never salvation or sanctification. Did it make you fly to the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ? Did it make you cling to the blood of Calvary? Did it make you long for his grace and goodness and salvation? Did it set your hearts on seeking him? Well, thirdly, God's moral holiness needs to be considered, not only in terms of his own glory and in terms of our sin, but also in terms of our own holiness. God's moral holiness applied to us through Christ and his atoning blood produces our holiness, which is far from God's, but makes us far different than we once were. Because then God's perfection becomes a standard for our moral character and one of our most important motivations for our religious practice. God's entire moral code flows out of his holiness. That's why the law is perfect and good. Human holiness is wholehearted, whole-minded obedience to God's law. The law of the Lord of hosts is the word of the Holy One of Israel, Isaiah says in chapter 5. And therefore, we strive, we must strive, we desire to strive, to live as obedient children who do their Father's will, heeding the call, be ye holy, for I am holy. Thomas Watson says it so beautifully. Our holiness consists in our suitableness to God's nature. 
and in our subjection of our will to his. True holiness means, Lord, take me. Consecrate me totally to thyself. Let me be like Caleb. Let me follow thee fully, 24-7, 365. I want to live entirely for thee. Through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, as Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2. And so we pursue holiness, not just because without it no one will see the Lord, Hebrews 12, 14, but because we yearn to participate in the holiness of God. We yearn for that day when we will be as holy as he is holy. We yearn for that day when we will be sin-free in Emmanuel's land. When Jesus will be able to look at you and me and see, say, I see no sin in my Jacob and no transgression in my Israel. John Owen said, if indwelling sin is not your greatest burden in this life, I seriously doubt if you're a Christian. But oh, to long to be with God forever in that perfect state where I just won't get blinks and glances of communion with him, but I will be able to gaze upon his face, whirl without end, and never have to look away, never feel a sense of shame again, but be completely enraptured with that beatific vision of being in the presence of a triune God and glorifying him, sin-free in Emmanuel's land, in utopian marriage with the Son of God. Oh, glorious holiness in everlasting glory. And so here, here in this life, we want what J.C. Ryle said. Holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God, hating what he hates, loving what he loves, and measuring everything in this world by the standard of his word. We pursue meekness and patience and gentleness and self-control in word and deed, self-denial, love, kindness, mercy, purity of heart, fear of God, humility, faithfulness in all our responsibilities, even though we always are coming short, even though our work of sanctification is always imperfect, we want to be more holy. We want to live more entirely to our God. And that leads me to my last thought, God's gracious holiness. God's gracious holiness. His holiness is not only majestic. His holiness is not only moral. It's also gracious. Verse 6 and 7 of Isaiah 6. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. And thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Oh, what a glorious verse that is. Upon beholding the sovereign majesty and glorious holiness of God, upon being penetrating to the core of his being with the light of God's purity, and crying out in abhorrence of sin, Isaiah receives three glorious, wonderful, astonishing, gracious blessings. First blessing he receives is the pardon of his sin. That iniquity is, is taken away. Now sometimes God takes it away gradually in the believer's consciousness. Other times, as in my own case, in my own personal spiritual pilgrimage, it was in a particular moment where I felt just like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, the burden rolled off my back into the empty sepulcher. That's how Isaiah, that's not that Isaiah wasn't converted before this, but he had a fresh sense now, a fresh sense of this iniquity being completely removed, free forgiveness, despite the holiness of God. Yes, because of the holiness of God, because the holiness of God, you see, through the Son of God would be manifest and through the cross he would pay the price that God required so that we might be drawn into this holiness of God. And so Isaiah, who was just a moment before confessing his sin with all his heart, 
now receives forgiveness with all his heart. He who had just deprecated himself to the lowest point receives the purity of God's grace, the filthy rags of his own righteousness, so that his best righteousnesses became unrighteous in God's sight, are now exchanged so that he sees the righteousness of God and is in this Christ and knows the pardon of his sin. The seraph actually says to him, thy sin is purged. And here in Hebrew, in the passive passive voice, it can literally be rendered, thy sin is atoned for. It's associated with the blood atonement in Numbers 35, 33. And of course, by extension today, with the blood of Calvary. And that is all symbolized by the burning coal. This was a coal from the altar of burnt offering. In the outer court, you remember, there was a bronze altar. And upon that altar, the priests of Israel would burn the animals that they had previously killed by the letting out of their blood. So the altar burned with fire day and night, never to go out, symbolizing the blazing holiness of the Lord as an all-consuming fire. And the animals, after shedding their blood, would be burnt on this altar to make atonement every day. The fire of judgment would condemn and consume the victims as substitute for the people. And the people would receive God's blessing, pointing to the Messiah to come. And so the burning coal in Isaiah's vision is a prophetic symbol. It bears the symbolism and significance of the altar on which the atonement is made. One commentator puts it this way, the live coal thus encapsulates the ideas of atonement, propitiation, satisfaction, forgiveness, cleansing, and reconciliation. And that live coal comes on the very lips that were entirely guilty. And so Isaiah's atonement doesn't ultimately come from the earthly temple altar, of course, but from the heavenly altar. In the heavenly temple, in the vision, he's seeing the archetypal temple in glory that the book of Hebrews talks about, Hebrews 8 and 9. The temple on earth is but a picture of the heavenly reality. It bore sacramental, symbolic significance of eternal salvation truths. And the heavenly temple is all about Jesus and his work of redemption. And so Isaiah's sin is atoned for ultimately by the one he wrote about, by the suffering servant, led as a lamb to the slaughter, crushed for Isaiah's iniquities on the cross. And so when Christ was forsaken by God upon the cross for our sins, dear believers, he was especially conscious of God's holiness. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Psalm 22, but it follows with this, but thou art holy. The eyes of the holy one cannot look with favor upon iniquity. Thomas Boston said, there's nothing wherein the divine holiness and hatred of sin is so manifest as in the sufferings of his own dear son. This was a greater demonstration of this hatred of God against sin than if all men and angels had suffered for it eternally in hellfire, Boston says. Yet it was precisely God's holiness that evoked Christ's trust that God would faithfully save him and all his people, as Psalm 22 goes on to say. So from beginning to end, Christ's obedient sufferings were engraved, as it were, with the words engraved on the golden plate of the high priest, Holiness unto the Lord, and yet pardon of sin. Well, God is gracious not only in pardon of sin to Isaiah, but the second thing Isaiah received was, was purging, purification, cleansing, sanctification. The coal symbolized the atonement made on the altar, but it was also a live coal, a burning coal. Fire purifies, and this symbolized the cleansing effect of God's grace in application. Isaiah talks about purging away the filth of the daughters of Zion in chapter 4.4. By the spirit of judgment 
and by the spirit of burning, he says. And salvation, the Holy Spirit comes like a purifying fire of judgment upon our sin, purging our pollution, sanctifying us by the communication of his holiness to us so that we would respond in holiness unto him. And that's just how salvation works. Everywhere in the Bible, justification always produces sanctification. Pardon always produces purification. Forgiveness always produces cleansing. There's no forgiveness of sin without also experiencing cleansing from sin. We cannot remain filthy and unclean as a people of unclean lips because God sanctifies our lips to his praise. He sanctifies our hearts to his devotion. He sanctifies our hands to his service. Isaiah here experiences both justification and sanctification. In fact, the third thing he receives is the assurance of pardon. The seraph says, Thy iniquity is taken away. It's an assuring, direct pronouncement, a direct testimony, as it were, of the Spirit to his soul, that he may know the joy of his salvation, that the dread and the despair might leave, and that the peace and assurance might flood his soul with a sense of profound relief. And so he cries out immediately, Here am I, send me. Oh, when God comes and justifies you and begins that process of sanctification and assures you that you belong to him and he belongs to you and you can say with a Heidelberger, my only comfort in life and death is that I don't belong to myself, but I belong to Jesus Christ. You will cry out, here am I, send me, use me, Lord. You have the rest of my life, Lord. Take me, use me, take my hands and let them be. Take my eyes, let them be. Take my entire body, my soul, all that I am, and let it be consecrated wholly to thee. Well, let me conclude by saying the right response to God's holiness is the fear of God. The childlike fear of God which John Brown defined as esteeming the smiles of God to be of greater weight and beauty than the smiles of men and the frowns of God to be greater weight than the frowns of men. When we stand in the holiness of God, redeemed by the blood of Christ, God becomes big and people become small. And we say with David, in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple all the day long. Psalm 5. Or we say, fearful and glorious is thy name, O Lord God, for holy and reverent is thy name. And we just want to sanctify God by fearing him, as Bavink put it. Sinful fear of God drives people from him. But godly fear of God attracts us to him. The holiness of God through Christ so works in the believer that we come to God with childlike fear. And that childlike fear beautifies and vivifies all our theology. And it makes our theology alive inside of us. It makes us reverence God so that we never joke about him or about his sacred truths, but we stand in awe at his sight. And we stand there humble, bowed down, stripped of pride. As Calvin put it, a Christian who stands before the cross of Calvary by the Father's right hand, who is filled with pride, is an oxymoron. You just can't be in the presence of this holy God and be filled with pride. What have you that you have not received? <laughs> 
And if you've received it, wherefore do you boast? You just simply want to say, Lord, help me to fear, fear thee all, all my life. Help me to hate sin all my life. Help me to love the beauty of thy holiness all my life. And come, Lord Jesus, come quickly and make me totally holy. That I no more have to cry out. The good that I would, I find myself not doing. And the evil that I do not do, would do not wish to do, I find myself doing. Oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, I long for the day, long for the day when I will fear God perfectly in glory forever. John Murray said that the core, the core of the fear of God is the controlling sense of the majesty and holiness of God in the believer's life. That's it. That's it. You see, then our theology takes up the whole man, the whole man, the mind, the will, the affections, the heart. Calvin said, the name of God is called holy because it is entitled to the highest reverence from us. And whenever the name of God is mentioned, it ought immediately to remind us of his adorable majesty. We dare not neglect God's holiness or the reverence that it inspires. For the fear of God is essential to Christ-centered spirituality. John Murray went on to say, The church walks in the fear of the Lord because the spirit of Christ indwells, fills, directs, and rests upon the church. And the spirit of Christ is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. This makes God to be a fountain of life for us. And it pours out energy in us to do our duty. The fear of God is the soul of godliness. So is your worship sluggish? Is your obedience half-hearted? Do you find yourself easily distracted by worldly desires and anxieties? Have you shrunk back from opportunities to speak up as a witness for the Lord? Seek a renewed sense of the beautiful, glorious holiness of God in his word. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your fear, let him be your dread, and he shall be a sanctuary for you, Isaiah says. And so when you, by grace, honor God's holiness, you will find that his holiness is and will be, in and through Christ Jesus, your hiding place and your joy and your reverence. And you will praise God for his majestic, moral, and gracious holiness. Amen. Gracious God, thou art so holy. We are so unholy. And yet thou hast made a way in Christ to bring us into a definitive state of holiness through our justification. And then to work out that holiness by thy Holy Spirit within us in our sanctification until the day dawns when we will be perfectly holy in thy sight, in the presence of thee, the thrice holy God, fearing thee perfectly forever and ever and ever. O oh Lord, we thank thee so much for thy holiness and so much for the cross. And so much for the Holy Spirit who makes us holy in Christ. Oh, continue to do the work more and more. May we become less and less and our holy God become more and more. We pray in Jesus' name.